Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Lightning Meditations podcast. Today, we are going to be going over the meditations of the week um, and uh, trying to figure out what the heck are these guys saying. Um, and I just want to go over Tuesday's quote, and I'm going to read it again for those of you who may not have read it or forgotten. The quote is by Linji Yishuan, and it says, Awakening and nirvana are hitching posts for donkeys. Let me read that again. Awakening and nirvana are hitching posts for donkeys. That doesn't seem very nice. What the heck does that mean? I mean, it doesn't sound good. What does that mean? Is that an attack? I'll go. Nico. Zohar, I mean, Nico? I, of course I chose the quote, but like, you know. <laughs> Zo Zohar? <laughs> I have thoughts. Um, so Nirvana and awakening are the same thing. Nirvana means enlightenment. Um, mm. Awakening is the experience of, well, before wokeness became a thing, uh, waking up, uh, getting into the truth, uh, going from a state of sleepness and dormancy to a state of alertness and, and awareness of what really is. And so if enlightenment is kind of like the realization that you come to the result, awakening is the process of getting there. So I think those are just two different ways of saying the same thing. Um, how are they hitching posts for donkeys? Well, presumably we are the donkeys, right? Um, human beings are like donkeys. And what's interesting is... What do you mean? Um, well... Um, we're, we're like animals generally because we have a lot of base instincts and base desires and we're super predictable. Like we just sort of are creatures of habit and, and the rest of it. But I think there's also all the crowd. Follow I think the crowd. Don donkeys are stubborn notoriously. Mm. Like there's sort of many cross cultural um, myths around like people like masters beating their donkeys. Cause like the donkey won't move. Um, and I think there's a way in, in which like, the, the donkey being attached to the hitching post is like, cause the donkey's got a mind of its own and it needs to be tied down. And so we need to be tied down to enlightenment and awakening, which again, I think it be begs some, some questions of what that metaphor actually then means practically. But I, huh. I, I think it's, I think it's like human nature is quite unenlightened. Um, but yet we have a connection to enlightenment nonetheless. Um, and then I think there's a, a higher meaning, which is like a non-dual interpretation, which is that despite the fact that we seem super unenlightened, that too is enlightenment. Hmm. There's enlightenment in the experience of actually being a, a dumb donkey. So don't hate too much. That's, that's, that's interesting. That's, that's so interesting, honestly, because I completely had a different idea in my head when I had to read it. I, let, allow me to explain. I thought it was saying that, like, I almost thought as if it was a place to, as a hitching post to, like, you know, attract and keep uh, fools, like a donkey as a fool. And just, I thought it was just one of those messages of, like, getting hyped on the it. I thought it was a very just, like, meta moment for the person to recognize that these high concepts just become talking points for people that they don't really understand what it is, but they flock to it anyways, so that it then becomes a trap uh, for people. That's so am I wrong for thinking that? And did you? Yeah, I had a similar I mean, Zohar sounds really nice, and now I'd like to have that view of humanity. Yeah. <laughs> I feel really cynical. <laughs> yeah, like, I would really like to believe that now. Um, but I think I took, obviously, like, donkey does have a stubborn connotation, but it also has, like, a negative connotation of all the things you could hitch. Like, a donkey is, like, the one you don't want to be, right? Like, I want to be a horse. I want to be something else. Um, and I think I read it as um, when you focus solely on awakening and enlightenment, you've actually limited yourself to like a certain perimeter of movement within life. 
And so if the sole focus of your life is singularly achieving that, you won't move very far. Whereas you need to like sort of go out and experience. And so I took it more as like experience is a kind Mm. of a flavor and like kind of like the exist beyond the perimeter of just being hitched to this singular post. Mm. And also like what is sold at a hitching post, like trinkets, right? Or like little, it's sort of like when a donkey. You, <laughs> or a donkey. I'm, I'm just like visualizing it's like, you know, when you're like driving for eight hours and you just stop at some random gas station, that's a hitching post for humans. So now cut that down to size a donkey in like an ancient world without highways. And he's just, you know, he's got to stop for provisions. And it's like, oh, that's, you know, go get a little enlightenment there. It sort of cuts it down to size. Yeah. Although what about the idea that like enlightenment is fuel for the journey? So the hitching, the hitching post allows the donkey to carry on rather than it being the destination. True. Why didn't they use horses then? (laughs) Get their pasture. It's a stable. (laughs) I think like, but you said earlier, like enlightenment isn't the journey. It's the end destination. So Mm. (laughs) I'm like, I don't know. Is that, is that not it? Like, awakening is is the road mm. enlightenment's the the terminus nice is the it was the pairing of the the prompts and also the music that led me to that interpretation especially the last prompt of keep it real like i thought it was like come on dude like be self like know what you're don't kid yourself you know like too much you know I don't know. Um, Keep then, it real is great because it has both a diminutive meaning of like don't be pretentious, but it has the opposite meaning <laughs> as well of like eyes on the prize, like don't fall for that, right. you know, pop, popular True. stuff. Like focus on the focus on reality. True, um, but like I feel in our world today, there's so many things telling you to like how to live. There's so many self help things that it feels like a it's hard to distinguish it from any other thing for me. And I know just being on Instagram, I'm bombarded by, you know, everything. And I, I get tons of those and it's from everyone and their mother has an opinion on how you should live your life and have their own sage quotes, you know, pop up. And mm. <laughs> but, nobody's telling, but nobody's telling me that enlightenment is a hitching post for a donkey. So exactly, exactly. <laughs> Say what you want about the meaning, at least. I gotta believe, gotta believe it. <laughs> gotta believe in Monday's quote. You may forget. Let me tell you this, but someone in some future <laughs> time will think of us. Somebody's somebody out there is telling you how to grow your your Twitter followers to a million, yeah. and other people are telling you to just hit yourself to that yeah. post. And, and so, <laughs> like, what are they talking about? No, but. The, the, the other thing was the music that uh, that Nico chose. It was a, uh, it was like a plucking instrument, like an Asian, like it was like a folk Chinese folk kind of tune, and it just seemed yeah. kind of like playful and silly. And the image, the art was just a bunch of donkeys lying around, and I just yeah. was like feeling like, are we the donkeys? Like, is this making fun of us? It felt like a very like, like a quote that was meant to make fun of like the reader. Uh, and I don't know if that's a common thing in Zen teachings when I don't know if the teacher becomes very like s- turns the the focus back in on the students or whatever. But Nico, what what can I get your two cents on this? Yeah, I mean, so I, I, I the, the, you know, the music, my, my wife, I, I'm going to explain this to the music. Why I exp- it's. Like you already have this thing that Nirvana and awakening. Uh, I'm just gonna like approach this from a little bit more technical side to like balance Anna and Zohar. That already this idea that Nirvana is such a big thing is a actually a denaturalization of what Nirvana is. Right? You get lost in the concepts and on the ideas. What do you? That mean? already happens. So, like in, like I would say, later Buddhism. Uh, there is this, um, I would say, 
there's the inner critique of what they're talking about when ah. they talk about in, enlightenment. So there's this kind of, I would call it like a spiritual jujitsu that happens where they try to get rid of everything that might tie uh, nirvana into a specific uh, term, concept, or understanding, or concept, fixed conception of what nirvana is, because nirvana is actually no conception at all. Um, so when you get to the, when you get to Chan, which is Linji Chuan, no, which is uh, um, this takes on a kind of a very kind of Quanish, like you know, jokey. Uh, format, no. Mm -hmm. So that's why I picked the music because I think there's this humoristic tonality to what what they're uh, to what they're saying, no. Um, I mean, that's pretty profound because, like, if you think about what were the other sort of like religions happening at the time, like, if I think it's like a very simple and not accurate parallel to draw like Nirvana and heaven, so I don't want to like make that correlation. But like to kind of look at your own, I don't even know if it's like highest ideal, if that's the right phrase, and then say, yeah, this is our limitation. Like, this is what's mm -hmm. holding us back. Like, that's a pretty like exceptional kind of like yeah. self-awareness, especially that like, you know, maybe mm -hmm. most religions don't offer themselves. <laughs> yeah. I, mean, I was going to say yeah. that. I'm oh, sorry. Go ahead, Azor. No, go ahead, Nika. <laughs> so I was going to say that you could say the same thing about salvation, right? If you, if you spend your whole life, I mean, uh, looking for salvation or looking for Nirvana, right? Um, that's what someone would, I mean, you could say that this is a, um, a negation of life also, right? Because you're postponing what you're now, the, the present moment or whatever you want to call it for a future, uh, uh, reimbursement, no? Uh, yeah so, and and yeah. I, do you see that self-awareness of like the future reimbursement as a limitation in like any other practice i, I would call it i wouldn't call it a, a limitation because I, I i do a further step in this way of thinking is that i don't think and you need some sort of post in in, in or like not all the time but you need some sort of post let's call it in the journey like the donkey needs to stop at one point and and have some mm. treats and drink some water. And, and yeah. like, I'm not saying there is nothing. What I'm saying is that um, what traditions have done is uh, you need to stylize life somehow. And by, let's say, saying, okay, there is life after death. There is a heaven. There is a, I mean, even in Buddhism, mm. there's a thing called pure land Buddhism where they just spend like, it's like they, they put in their chips every day to get into the pure land. So it's like a, it's a Calvinist form of Buddhism. Mm. Wow. <laughs> that happens in China around that same time. So, uh, <laughs> so the, my point is that um, when you project something into your future, you like you naturally stylize the yeah. present moment. Uh, so it's I would call it limitation. I would call it stylization of a lifestyle, a form of life. Do Someone you think call it that. Do you yeah. think the text has one precise intended meaning and the job of the interpreter is to figure out what it is, like almost like a detective? Or do you think it is, this is my view, just my bias when I read these sort of koanic type texts, mm -hmm. is it's saying multiple things that are in fact contradictory. And then you're supposed to almost like in an optical illusion experience that same, like, is it a, you know, is it an hourglass or is it a witch? feel that at the conceptual level and then somehow transcend that conflict by a, a experience almost like a unity of that. So with the hitching post metaphor, I feel like I see it as in Nirvana as a means to an end. It's not a big deal. Like, mm -hmm. you know, you stop it, you stop at the gas station, you get your cigarettes and your Pringles and then you carry on like, Oh, you just get a little Nirvana and then right. Um, but at the same time, I see it as the opposite view <laughs> <laughs> you know, okay, fine. Yeah, let's throw in a root beer as well. Um, yeah, but that's why that's why I put that's, really yeah, that's why the snarky 
That's why the snarky comments, you know, like I, I that's it, it's a weeping post, you know, it's not an itching post. <laughs> yeah. Wait, wait, wait. The second possibility, though, is is I think what you were getting at, which is almost the idea of like it is the end in and of itself. There's no, there's nothing else. Like mm-hmm. in contrast, let's say to religious worldviews that emphasize transcendence, like um, salvation is coming in the next world, or it's just around the corner. It's like mm-hmm. no, like you're here. You're at the you're at the hitching post. It's super mundane. Like it looks unremarkable. This is enlightenment. Yeah. Like just wake up and and smell the gasoline fumes. Um, <laughs> I mean, you could you could <laughs> definitely just, take it that way for sure. The, the wrinkled skin of the cashier, like staring you down, like wondering like what why you're in this part of town. Like that is enlightenment. Like yeah. um which actually like this is a. It opens up a huge question, huge can of worms that I'd love to get into with you guys Open in it. terms of like um, something I've been thinking a lot about because Rosh Hashanah, the Jewish New Year is tonight. Um, the word transcendence has a lot of different meanings. One, one meaning is um, spatial, like that which is above you. Another meaning is theological, like sort of that which is ideal. Um, sometimes like people refer to God or the gods or something as transcendent, but then there's actually this aspect of transcendence that's temporal, which is the one that I'm most interested in, which is this idea of, um, like this coming year, Nico and Anne and Cyrus are all going to do and realize various things that right now they haven't. And so what is your relationship to that future? That future is transcendent relative to where you are now and like existentialist philosophy that say where you are now is your facticity, how you understand yourself in your world now. And transcendence is that your trajectory for possibility. And within that, there's actually even a transcendence of transcendence, which is the possibility within possibility. Like maybe I, I, we have a certain forecast of where we're going to be in a year, but then within that, there's also things we can't foresee. And then what what really makes it interesting is the aspect of human agency and free will, which is the idea that we cannot we can actually change our course and participate in this transcendence. So how does that relate to the hitching post and the uh, nirvana? Well, I think that um, we live in a secular society by and large, and I also think that tracking with this secular tendency is a certain rejection of transcendence in all guises. So not just atheism and scientism, which say there's no like spirituality to the world, but also in a certain way, a cultural rejection of the idea of striving to overcome your current nature and your current reality and become a new person. And instead this idea of like, I am who I am and society should accept, accept me exactly as I am. And like, we don't have to get into details because I think that's where there'll be like various controversy. But like, I, I see a general like move towards inclusion um, in a way as, as, a, as a rejection of the idea that a person should change their nature um, and transcend how they are. And instead saying it's society that's wrong for not just accepting you as you are. And so how that maps to this interpretation of the hitching post is that um, it, it does make a difference whether we see the hitching post as the destination or whether we see it as just fuel for the journey. Because it, if it's fuel for the journey, then we're still saying that a person should strive to be a better version of themselves in a year or five years or 10 years. And if we're saying that the hitching post is the destination, then as beautiful as it is to say, like, be in the present moment, aren't we also kind of throwing in the towel and saying, oh, you know, you're you're perfect, honey, just keep doing you. And meanwhile, the person's actually suffering um, and doesn't know how to ask help because God forbid we pathologize them. Yeah, this this actually was on Instagram a while back where there was this trend and it was, uh, if you can't handle me at my worst, you don't deserve me at my best. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And it was, yeah. I did, and, and it was around for a while until people started calling it out and they're like, why are you, why are you putting people through the worst? Like, why do you want to be your worst? Like, is that really such an acceptable state that we should to your point like not only like allow it but also like celebrate the it's kind of like that that takes on like a celebratory note right like or just like a deep 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 acceptance of like my worst is a stagnant point that cannot be moved 
but it's counterbalanced by my best. Um, so yeah, I think, I think like that's very, very visible in a lot of ways, even on the way people present themselves on social media. Yeah. hundred percent agree with Anne. Yeah. It's, it's, it's kind of sad. It's kind of sad. I've, <laughs> I've, I've, I've... <laughs> <laughs> so what do we do about that? <laughs> it's funny because yesterday was um I'm sorry uh, Cyrus um uh, yesterday was talking to um he's he's a student he's here with, he just finished his thesis he's a PhD friend of mine who just wrote a thesis on um it's how algorithms, it's crazy. It has nothing to do with religion. It's, it's how like the algorithmic social media reifies society. Like, <laughs> uh, so it's not that people, you know, post stuff about how they feel. Like the fact that they post them is changes the way they are, you know? Uh, so yeah, like this, this whole point mm-hmm. of uh, what you were saying is, you know, it's like, I, you have to accept me the way I am in my lowest, no? Because yeah. I don't accept myself in the way that I'm lowest, so you have to do it first. Like uh, it's like putting oh. all the responsibility outside, you know. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But uh, I mean, that's that's yeah, why. No, really, there's, I guess. there's no. That's interesting because I think I hadn't thought about it that way before. That it implies there's no like internal metric for what is good or not good in terms of your own actions. It's all about like perception and it's, well, it's only qualified why yeah. what people deem your worst or your best. It's obscenity really. That's the, I mean, I'm, it's a, that's a strong word, but what I mean by this is that I'm going to cut my wrists in front of you and you have to accept everything that I'm going to show you. You know, that's, that's, that's the definition of something that's obscene. It's like, there is no, There is no space for intimacy. And I think this is the way that a lot of social media works is that you end up showing, uh, you end up showing an aspect of your life and then your, your, your life just becomes that aspect. Mm. And there is nothing, you know, there is nothing because normally you would say, Oh, I see the Instagram. Mm. I would like to know how the person is in real life. No, it's, it's, there is nothing there. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Um, Hmm. So, so is enlightenment actually more than a hitching post, but we are just incapable of I seeing more than one aspect. Yeah. And so yeah. it's the hitching post is, is actually, it's not saying this is actually what enlightenment is. It's almost criticizing us and say, you donkeys, like you just see what's in front of you. And then you call that enlightenment sort of, there's a similar, almost skeptical, a maxim attributed to Xenophanes, a pre-Socratic poet. Um, he says, if if um, if human beings were were horses, then the gods would have hooves. Um, which mm-hmm. is right. It's a, just a way of saying that we depict God in our own image, and that God is much bigger than what we can conceive of. But we're so small-minded that we're always going to shrink God down to human size. Which you see that same argument made even in the medieval period by the likes of a Maimonides, a Jewish theologian, who would say that um, even saying that God is good, even saying that God is all-powerful, or those sort of classical things, um, are a kind of reduction of God's infinity down to something small and tangible. You can go even further, as some of the mystics do, and say even even saying that God exists is a mm-hmm. diminishment of God. Um, which then gets you into this mystical atheism where like it's the, into the, doubt. Only, the the truest thing you can say of God is that God is nothing. And it's funny because I was um now Zohar's living oh, up to his name. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I was uh I, I I'm reading a book by um Hans Urus von Balthasar, which is like one of the, perhaps the most important Catholic theologians of the twentieth century. He almost became a cardinal. I think Anne, you would love him. Put that in the bio. Like, <laughs> almost became a cardinal. <laughs> he almost became a cardinal by the end of his life. Like, extreme, extremely I like the fact calculated. that he didn't make it. I'm intrigued by that. Like It's like, well, what, what was the almost limitation? Yeah. <laughs> he Eternal died. Power That's it. He oh, died. Yeah. He just died. He died, yeah. He was, on deck to, he was on deck to be the pope, you know? Like, he was like the, he was like the vice pope. <laughs> yeah. Well, 
Yeah. <laughs> um, I, yeah, that's good. That's fine. I um, I definitely. It's a. This is. I wanted to suggest it to you, Anne, because he's. He's a theologian. He puts beauty at the beginning of everything, then uh, action, and then logic. So, like, it's he's a, like he's, yeah, he's great. So, I'm reading this book by him. It's a kind of a, a small apologetic, apologetic book called Prayer. It's a meditation on, on Christian prayer, and he has this. I mean, I should bring it here and read it. Should I? Like the, the quote that I'm gonna. There's a quote there that I found. Yeah. That he said, yeah. Well, let me just let me find it. Yeah, it's right here. Right here. Right here. I'm sitting on the floor, as you might uh, see. So, yeah, I have it right here. It's not very long. Um, I'll just read it. Natural mysticism and religion is an expression of man's seeking for God. By inner necessity, natural mysticism represents a centrifugal edos. Love, no? Uh, flying up from the earth and in its search to rush past everything that might point the way to God, seeing only that it is not God, it is always in danger of losing both the world and God. It can lose the world simply because it is not God and God because he is not the world. And without the help of the things of the world which mirror him, him, God, can only be experienced as the absolute void, the abyss, nirvana. And this is coming from a Catholic theologian, by the way. <laughs> so, um, what does this mean? Um, I, my, my way of reading it is that, you know, Zohar, you said it uh, like a few minutes ago that we live in a secular society and like that there is a, there, there is, well, you didn't say there is no belief, but we live in a secular society. I, I disagree, but not because I, I I I do not agree on what you say. I just do not believe that it is possible. Um, I think you know what there was the idea of a homo religiosus, a, 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 yeah. a religious human, is not this idea of oh by necessity all human beings uh, are religious, you know. It means that you cannot escape that predicament of having some sort of, call it, mm. um, teleology in your life. So, like, nobody can live life without having some sort of unconscious or implicit yeah. uh, North Pole or hitching post, for that matter. And even in secular society, you have that. It's just that, yeah. 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 I think like even like Neil Gaiman's American Gods, I think like depicts that in kind of like a literal fashion where like this is a fantasy novel, but essentially the old gods like Zeus and Thor and these Demeter have been replaced by technology. So his like the point is that there's always a worship fascination. There's always going to be a point. Uh, it just depends on what it is. Yeah, but I... I mean, I, I think there's a difference between worshiping something beyond yourself, um, something grand and something ideal, and worshiping yourself. Like, for sure, for sure, we've we've taken religious imagery and we've modified it. But like, if you go to Equinox, this is in a book called Self Made by Tara Burden, and you look at like Equinox's ads for like basically how working out will turn you into a god. Um, I I think. We're not strangers to deification, but the idea of self-deification, mm. it's again, it's like it's 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 a fine balance. It's a dialectic. Like there was a point in time where maybe we were too focused on what's outside of ourselves. Then we discovered the self, and that was a good thing because there is such a thing as human choice and human dignity and human agency. But arguably, as we became more modern, we moved away from the idea of the human being as a vessel or instrument for achieving the transcendent and moved to this idea of like the human being is God um, and there is nothing outside. And then even more focused to the individual is God. And so we're back to neo-paganism where I'm fighting you because for superiority and dominance and one of us prevails and then whoever ends up the, the biggest billionaire, whatever, Bill Gates or Jeff Bezos, they're essentially the pharaoh. Um, and everybody else like wants to be them and maybe thinks that internally they are like, I have Jeff Bezos dysphoria. I I'm also worth a hundred billion dollars. Just nobody sees it yet. Um, 
<laughs> why, why why wouldn't they see my inner truth? Um, <laughs> so, um, anyways, like the the backstory on this is is fascinating, and we don't need to get like too into it. But actually, interestingly enough, like the the bastard is a historical figure that plays a huge role in this movement. Um, when you look at Shakespeare's King Lear, Edmund the Bastard has all this ambition to make it, and he's kind of a, um, presented as a villain. But um, in the early modern period, a lot of innovation came from these people who didn't stand to inherit and thus were forced to be resourceful. And they came up with this sort of new mythology that they are actually, they have a spiritual aristocracy. It's just not recognized by society. And so thus the concept of a certain dysphoria was born, this idea that your self-conception is more true than what society sees and that it's your job to actually make society see your inner truth and manifest that inner truth in the world. Um, which I think then goes hand in hand with this idea of <clears throat> there's not, there's nothing outside of the self. So that's what I mean by secularism. I mean, this, that the self decides good and evil. It becomes aesthetic. Like if I want to dress like Grimes or Kim Kardashian or whatever, um, I I can do that, and then like if enough people follow me and worship me, then I've proven myself as a demigod. I don't want to like what, what about narcissism, yeah. but I do want to see you dressed as friends, like a hundred percent, and I would like that to be the next week's. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm gonna I do a public suicide, but who is Grimes? <laughs> you don't want to know. <laughs> Grimes. Grimes Rapper? is um, a musician and conceptual artist who I actually followed her work before she was famous uh, when she, you know, when she was just Grimes, but then she married. Oh, she's you. married to Elon Musk, right? Yeah. She, yeah, she, yeah, was, yeah she, was, she was, yeah, they had, they yeah. had a kid. Um, and then she's just become like a pop influencer. And she's also m like one of the more, um public facing uh what's the word her her vibe is very much cyborg so there's like a whole silicon valley movement that's like about positively embracing the the blurring of the distinction between the human and the machine and so like grimes will like dress in a way that is sort of like cyberpunk to emphasize this idea that she's merging with the machine and obviously, the machine. Like, obviously like Elon Musk wanted, you know, with Neuralink wants to put brain chips in us. So there's like a certain continuity there, but whatever. <laughs> yeah. well, wait, say yeah. It's a hitching yeah. post for a donkey. Is what yeah, it's it's a hitching for, yeah. yeah, I just want to go back I, to. Yeah, I'm just going to lay it flat. I do not believe in human agency, full stop. Like. <laughs> <laughs> well, I would say I would say that whether human agency is real or not, um, if you would like to have a better life, mm -hmm. it's a good thing to believe in. So I'm sorry, we gotta go back human, to that. human agency. Like people just like lobbed a grenade, and I need to process. It. Like, <laughs> what does that mean that you don't believe in human agency? No, I, mean, I think I think this is more of like we're gonna. I don't want to go too much into this rabbit hole, but it, it has to do with everything. I mean, it has to do with the quote at the end of the day, which is like, um, you might pursue things in the interest of yourself, but you never know. You never know if, first of all, if it's your interest, and if the pursuer will will accrue the interest. And this is my. It's not that I, I just do not believe in human being. I don't. I don't mean that. It's more that I think it's a futile endeavor from the start, <laughs> or like guaranteeing some sort of. Um, I think the wisdom is in the is in the acceptance that you're not guaranteed anything. Uh, I I I have a different view. Yeah, I, I have a different view. <laughs> yeah, I know. I'm shocked. I, of <laughs> course, I know. I'm super. I'm super bullish on human agency. Like I have, <laughs> I have an entire like metaphysical and theological worldview built around the idea that like human life is an incommensurate good relative to other things, and the reason why 
is because human life has inbuilt into it just profound optionality. And the driver of that optionality, by optionality meaning ability to produce all kinds of outcomes that are in that moment almost impossible to imagine from the point of view of just a very small-minded rational accounting. Um, <clears throat> we'll get into a specific in a second. But like, so Nassim Taleb, uh, he, he wrote a book, uh, many books, uh, Black Swan, um, Fooled by Randomness, uh, Skin in the Game. He's a, he started off as an options trader and then basically pivoted to becoming a statistician and philosopher. And he has one very core theme, which he hits home over and over again, that fuses ancient skepticism with this practical approach to like investment decision making. <clears throat> um, so people don't appreciate tail risk. That's that's the that's the point. What is what is tail risk? Tail risk um, can be a positive or it can be a negative. The tail risk at the negative level would be the op the possibility of a wipeout, the possibility of a blow up event in which you're destroyed uh, by a catastrophe. And a tail risk on the positive side would be the opportunity for a life changing outcome where all of a sudden you're, you know, Alexander the Great or whatever it is, you're top of your field or your wealth gr grows by a thousand times or something like this. Like both the average mind just doesn't have the ability to imagine either of these um, tail events. And um, the result of that is that we misprice um, the optionality of both. So people will not pay for insurance that they should in the case of a wipeout because they think it will never happen. And on the positive event, they don't make small bets on the opportunity that one of those small bets will pay off. Mm. Well, my view is that a human life is a call option on profundity, uh, on pr tremendous outcomes. And just by being alive, especially if you're young, you have like the opportunity for a 100,000 X return, um, either for yourself or for humanity. Um, but people are mispricing that uh, potential. So the reason why is I, I think connected to human agency. And I don't think it matters. Here, here's the point. The point is it doesn't, it doesn't matter um, whether you yourself can conceive of your upside. Um, just by pursuing whatever small goal you have, you are creating further optionality. When Starbucks, right. I gave this example to Anne before, like when Starbucks went from being one coffee store to becoming like a global brand and franchise, um, they didn't they didn't know that they were going to be generating so much revenue from the Starbucks app on the iPhone, and that most like a good like a good percentage of Starbucks current profitability actually comes from people placing to go orders. Um, even though Starbucks originated as the third space where people would meet, now the actuality of Starbucks like revenue generation comes from people that are like busy and not going to Starbucks to meet. Mm -hmm. that's what I'm saying is that it doesn't matter that this, that the founder of Starbucks didn't conceive of that by virtue of creating this iconic brand. He created further optionality down the line that would track with all kinds of other gains. I mean, I do, I do agree with everything you said, but my point or let's say my question to you and what, in regards to what I said before is don't you think that people get hung up on their possibilities and don't turn them to actualities. They get no? hitched on them. So like, where, so what I mean is that like the whole like, okay, if you're not guaranteed, what I meant is that you never know what the outcome is going to be, and a lot of people don't do certain things just because they don't. They're not guaranteed as a, a result in what they do. Mm, and I think the opposite. I think most people are quite risk averse and short termist. So like another example, like Taleb gives is like. Let's say you have a person with like a white collar job that pays $100,000 a year or whatever in some office, and they think that they're very secure um, because they don't imagine a financial crisis or they don't imagine a scenario in which their entire industry gets wiped out um, or one in which there's, you know, is a new CEO and all of a sudden like that CEO decides a new strategic direction and does layoffs or, or, or their job gets automated or any number of things. Like they're not thinking that they're just like, oh, I'm set and I have my yearly income and therefore I can forecast a budget and I can buy this kind of home and have this kind of lifestyle. 
and that person is super vulnerable because psychologically, like they can't imagine an alternative. Whereas like an Uber driver, somebody or a taxi driver who has much more like lumpy schedule and much more lumpy income. And it's very unpredictable week to week, month to month is much better suited for a crisis because they they've already practiced this adaptability. So I think that's really the point is, um, so it's, most a, of, it's, it's a environmental factor then, or like, is this an innate human thing or is it based on like external factors that create that mindset within you? Mm, that's a good point. So in his own experience, like the reason why he became obsessed with tail risk is because he grew up in Lebanon and then had to leave the country during a civil war. Um, in which like many of his family members like were either like the objects of violence or like had their wealth stolen or various things. So he became sensitive to it. So I think that he would say that the trigger is environmental for this realization, but that the truth is universal. Um, and, and so then I guess, you know, to put it in Talebian terms, waking up in Nirvana isn't having no mind and no thoughts and no attachment. It's actually the realization of convexity, which is just a statistical graph that shows what an outlier event looks like. And most of us just think linearly. So we don't we don't think about the huge curve that can go up or go down. Right, right, the, right. The, right. Person at the, 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 the person at the top of the world doesn't realize that they're actually like a hair away from losing it all. And the person who's like in rags, um, who's had such a tough life, doesn't realize that they're one opportunity away from a radically positive transformation. But I have a question on this. Sorry, Nico. But if you're, no, no, no. if you're holding these extremes in your mind constantly, does that like evoke like a intellectual fatigue? Like that's almost mm. like an, like an intellectual adrenal fatigue to like constantly be prepared for you know, falling off the, the edge of a razor. And I think like, I, I also like kind of like, uh, think of um, a lot of, you know, uh, practices which like sort of avow for the middle way, which is like moderation in a lot of things. So like, how do those two things, they seem to be in like complete tension. Like how do those, how, how does one like be prepared for catastrophe, but leave like a lead a moderate life? Or is the goal not mm. moderate life in this thought? Well, that's a great point. Like, I think maybe dispositionally it would be hard to walk around thinking about catastrophe all the time, but maybe there's certain precautionary things you can do. So it's just about having a little bit more humility. Like, for example, when taking out insurance, like why not spend the extra, whatever it is for the, for the best possible insurance in a downside scenario, rather than getting like moderate insurance. It's like, no, if like, the, if the, if you're, once you're thinking about the downside scenario, think about the absolute worst case scenario. Don't don't be cheap. Uh, of course, you could not buy insurance at all. But like once you're thinking about insurance, like what you certainly don't want is you're paying for insurance and then the bad thing happens and there was like some little like thing in the contract that you didn't think about and now you're like the insurance you bought is worthless. Um, like I mean, I think a lot. Like here's the thing. Like, and I'm no expert at this, so I'm kind of talking out of my armpit on this, but. Um, <laughs> I think a lot of people that let's say sign contracts, um, sign it with the assumption that like, it's never going to come to needing this contract because things are great right now. Um, but the whole purpose of a contract is imagine the absolute worst case scenario in which you're now enemies with the counterparty and like, they're trying to screw you. Um, if the contract can't help you in that situation, then it's not a good contract. But most people psychologically don't want to go into that state of mind when signing the contract, so they just sign it. You know what I mean? Uh, I think that that's where Taleb would be like, no, like, just just entertain the possibility, even if it's the difference between it's a one in ten thousand chance versus a one in one thousand chance. But like, mm -hmm. don't dismiss it as a one in ten thousand. Like, yeah, it's, it's funny. One thousand. I'm just gonna say something funny, which I mean, it's. We have become bad masochists, I think, you know, because we're, we're, we, we are in the, we, we are in the, <laughs> huh? we, we, we are just bad masochists because we are in the interest of, you know, deferring pleasure. Uh, so not deferring, but like establishing that pleasure comes after pain and not the other way around. But, you know, uh, 
and that's a masochistic thing, like they, they defined like as a definition. But you need a contract to establish those terms. We don't pay attention to the contract anymore. We just say, oh, this is the way it is, like, you know, fuck it, or whatever. <laughs> so, like, so, like, you never get the pleasure, you know, you just suffer and suffer and suffer. It's like, hey, where's, where's the contract here? Like, where, where, what are the terms to my suffering? <laughs> Oh um, my gosh, I, I love it because my partner and I sometimes we'll just look at each other and we'll just be like, "Life is suffering," and we, then we like burst out laughing. Yeah. But like, yeah, like I guess we haven't defined the terms to where. Well, but I mean, mm. I was talking. I, I told this story the other day in his podcast, but um, I mean, that's the first noble truth of the Buddha. You know, like, there is suffering. Um, yeah. We're, the, we're, we're profound Buddhists in our apartment. Yeah, here. <laughs> but but you know the thing which is which is inter- interesting about that 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 uh, proposition is that in Sanskrit, I guess, which is like the the OG language where when were uh, through which that through which um, the Buddha pronounced that proposition is that suffering in in Sanskrit is the term is dukkha, no, or dukkha, and. Normally in Sanskrit, you can derive uh, any nominal, any noun from a verb root because everything is constructed out of verb roots in Sanskrit, no? It's a kind of a philosophical thing, but forget about that. But dukkha, no. That, like dukkha, there is like not a clear um, etymology to the word, to, to put it in that way. And people have tried to... Um, uh, like give a concrete ex- definition of what, what, how is dukkha constructed, or what actually dukkha means. What does suffering mean? And it's it's very weird. <laughs> it's uh, it's it's much more kind of brass tacks than it, than you would actually think. Uh, I think one of the definitions is like burial, you know, or something like this. So, uh, yeah, I was just gonna say that it's like yeah, it's it's. It is very simple, yeah. It's it's very fundamental, but at the same time, still mysterious. Uh, and 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 of course, Zohar is going to tell me something now that uh... <laughs> <laughs> professor uh, the professor's yeah. mind yeah. is brewing. I, I was going, I was going more to my absurdist tendency, which is uh, <laughs> to a <Duka> goose. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Oh boy! Oh, that's fantastic! <laughs> what a hitching post that was. <laughs> this whole conversation, yeah. fantastic, fantastic. Well, do we have any more thoughts on this? Uh, on this, this quote, guys. That was. Uh, I think. I think. I don't want us to go too far down the rabbit hole. I think that was fantastic. I, mean, I was going to say, thank God we didn't look at Fridays. You know. <laughs> <laughs> you know what you know what let's do it let's do it the quote that uh, Nico is referring to is this by St. Paul from the book of Philippians in the Bible work out your own salvation with fear and trembling for it is God which worketh in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God which worketh in you, both to will and to do of his good pleasure. What does that mean? Nico, what do you think that means? Well, I I picked the quote because, I mean, I think it's a super powerful quote, but... um... Um, it, it's kind of the birth of existentialism right there, you know, like that's Kierkegaard's hitching post. That's where he gets the fear and trembling <laughs> thing. <laughs> it's like, okay, wh- okay, I get the whole like God thing, whatever, but why, why fear and trembling? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and um, mm-hmm. I think I, that's the most interesting part of the quote. It's like, you, you work out your salvation with fear and trembling. I don't know, I guess in, in Greek, the term trembling itself also. So like there's something there that is not simply just like being afraid. It's, it's actually right. a, a it's sort rapturous of rapturous almost. Exactly. Right? Yeah. 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 Mm-hmm. 
Um, oh, I, oh. I have a I have a thought yeah. on I have a thought on this, which is, um, of course, within the Eastern tradition, there's there's varieties of of spiritual practice, um, like tantra focuses on the ecstatic um, and the sensual, but most I would say focus on the ascetic. So the goal is like, let's say clearing your mind. Um, when you talk about fear and trembling, it seems to be the exact opposite, right? It's like, this is like, is the, is, is truth about quieting the mind and like not having noise or it's about actually this full body experience of like almost like a spiritual panic attack. Um <clears throat> So just highlighting that I think these are completely different paths, but perhaps they both respond to the same dukkha, ultimately, which is like, hey, life is suffering. What should we do about it? And in one, it's like detach yourself, disassociate, just notice it, abstract yourself, like stop being a person and an individual and just like see this sort of pattern of the universe working through you. And the other is like a hyper personalism of like, yeah, you're here. It's it sucks even worse than you thought it did. It's a hundred times worse. And not only that, but God is pulsing through you, and God is the cause of your anguish. <laughs> right. <laughs> um, but somehow, like both of them are like attempts to use like mind tricks um, to change your orientation to the average way of being. And I think that also t- responds to Anne's point about the mental fatigue. Which is like, let's play the devil's advocate and say, what if the most fatiguing thing is not to be self-aware of your mental um, process and the greatest liberation involves some kind of agency over your mental state, Um, whether that's cultivating fear and trembling or whether that's quieting the mind or whether it's summoning up this idea of a tail event that all of those acts are actually acts of transcendence in some way. Closing thoughts and Nico. No. Fantastic. I, I, I was just going to say that I like just to, I think that, you know, there is the, the ascetic way and the call it the incarnated way. Right. Um, I think the end goal of both is the same though. Uh, which is, I mean, in my way of looking at it, is it's sovereignty, you know? Mm. Yeah. Um, so it's like not being, I mean, you know, there's a, there's a famous, um, uh, well, I, I, I say he's Armenian, but he's Armenian, Armenian mystic called uh, G.I. Gurdjieff. Maybe you heard of him. Uh, and he has this famous, um, he has this famous, well, it's a metaphor. It goes, uh, my, my, uh, so a person is a house with a lot of servants with no master. Where's the master? You know, uh, and I think that's I, that, that's what I'm pointing to. Yeah. Hmm. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, on that note, we're just gonna, we're gonna, just have to leave them. Yeah. Gonna, <laughs> gonna have to leave you guys to decipher that one, folks. Yeah, I was like, that's gonna haunt me all day. I want to go make lunch and be like, who is the master? Of this I'm just picturing. I'm just picturing the self now as Downton Abbey. <laughs> Yeah. Wow. I think that speaks to a very positive like view of yourself that you're like <laughs> this beautiful. There's all like, kinds of transaction thanks. happening between upstairs yeah. and downstairs, you know. <laughs> yeah. It's a really Fantastic. nice setting of choice, you know. Yeah. <laughs> In the metaverse right. that will be possible. Uh, all right guys, thank you so right. much. <laughs> thank you so much for joining us today. And Nico Zohar and you I am Cyrus. Thank you for listening to Lightning Meditations.